Good morning, church. For uh, the kiddos going to Sunday school, or you can are dismissed now. Parents, you can take them on back there. It's good to see everybody. It's really good to see everybody. Um, and I want to say good morning to those at home. Good morning to those I believe still listening uh, across the Atlantic to our services every Sunday. Um, we're glad to have you. Glad that that this. Video ministry is available for those people, too. We miss you. We look forward to uh, eternity with you one day. As we begin, um, if you'd pull out your phones, pull out your Bibles, and go ahead and stand with me. If you don't have a Bible, you can use your phone. I'm giving permission this morning. If you just don't have a Bible in general, you are welcome to, you know, go back to the lost and found. You might find a Bible like I did this week with your name on it back there. Um, I left mine last week and it was retrieved because it was in the lost and found. This morning, we get to continue our study in the book of Colossians and we're going to read through this, this passage together. If you would, I'm going to read Colossians chapter 4 verse 10 through 16. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. They have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for all those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea, Nympha, and the church in her house. And I read one verse more than I am preaching today, so I'm going to stop right there. We're going 10 through 14. Let's pray together. Pray, uh, 10 through 16. Father, as I stand with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I am going to just confess this morning I'm nervous. Um, you have given God time for us as a church to be in your word, in this book. And now we get to have this opportunity that I've gotten to study through and I have a, a heart and a desire to communicate this morning your word accurately and your word passionately to our church that we might stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. God, I pray that you would use this morning that you would use this passage, you would use this preaching to heal relationships, to encourage us in our walks with you and our enjoyment of you, Lord. So, Lord, we give you this time and we pray that you would have your way in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. So over the last few weeks, I'm going to just step back through the last few weeks of sermons. Uh, last week we had our Mission to Mexico service recap. Everybody was up here on the stage. And it was wonderful. It was a great service. It was great to hear and see the things that took place. And it was even fun that Dylan got us as a group of Baptists to dance at the end. And I wanted to point out, nobody got struck by lightning. Amen? All right. So that was wonderful. It was great. The week before that, Pastor Mark took us into this section of the book of Colossians by preaching on Tychicus and Onesimus. And he pointed out that as we're approaching this, Paul is laying out his group of missionary elders and how these men are pointing us towards maturity in Christ and elder quality individuals. And that's what we're going to be gleaning out of today is we're going to continue that idea of elder quality individuals, men and women, walking together as a church. Then I missed the week earlier, and I listened to it this last week online, 
and I was just blown away by the, the heart that we have in this church and the rhythm we have in this church and the encouragement we get in preaching of the rhythm of life of breathing in and breathing out. We breathe in the spirit of God, we breathe in his word, and we exhale and we confess our sins and we work with one another and we get rid of the baggage. We breathe in and we breathe out as we mature in Christ. We walk this process out. Paul has taken a lot of time when he wrote this letter, and we've taken a lot of time studying this letter for an understanding that Jesus is all, and he is in all. This rhythm of putting off and putting on, we get to continue thousands of years later as the church putting off putting on, growing in our maturity and being fully assured in all the will of God. Paul lists eight companions. Two of them we've already talked about previously, so we get to hit six of them today. We're going to find out little bits of information about them, and then we're going to look at this passage in four ways. We're going to see from these four the need for companionship. The intentionality of vocation, the maturity of prayer, and the reality of relationship. So those are the four things that we're going to be looking at today as we're going through a list of people. The need for companionship, the intentionality of vocation, maturity of prayer, and the reality of relationship. And if you have a bulletin, I gave you, or I, had, I, I sent it off, and I'm really thankful that it got put into the bulletin. A notes page that we're going to hit towards the end. So that, that little protocol in there, I didn't know what to call it, um, except for it's a relationship diagram. It's something Pastor Mark introduced me to like three years ago one night, and it hit me so hard. It was so incredibly helpful in my life. I wanted to go over and share it, and it's in the relational elder training. So many of you have probably seen it in some form or fashion, but we're going to use that today. So you can use that page, make notes. I'm going to ask you to take some notes on it as we're going through it. Um, If you need a bulletin, you can grab one still. So we're not going to go through these men in chronological order as it's written. We're going to just kind of take them here and there as we need. So we're going to start the need for companionship. Paul points out there's three that are Jewish, heritage, and there's three that are not Jewish in heritage out of this section. There's Jews, which are Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice. These are Paul's countrymen, and he gives a snippet and says, these men have been a comfort to me in his labors. These three men have been a comfort to me. Why would that be a comfort? Paul had a heart for his countrymen. He even says at one point, I wish I was accursed for the sake of my countrymen. He loved his people. His people beat the daylights out of him time and time again. He loved them. And he had a few of them that were with him. It would be such an encouragement for Paul to say, look, I love this group, this nationality, as the church is expanding to Gentiles around the world. I love this particular group. My countrymen, they are a comfort to me. They are proof that from the beginning of the church, God has been working in the Jewish people from the very beginning. These men are a comfort. We don't know much about all of them. First, we get Aristarchus. He's a Jewish Macedonian man from Thessalonica who had been accompanying Paul on his journey. And what we know about him, he's in jail. He's in jail with Paul. We don't get a whole lot more in scripture about him. That's what we get. He's a companion of Paul. He's an elder quality man. And guess what? He's also in jail. And then we get Justice, who's also called Jesus. And all we know about this Jewish man is he worked with Paul, and he's got the same name as our Savior. So he's got that going for him. Kind of like the people who were born on Christmas. That's what you get. So, Jesus, who is called Justice, Aristarchus, and then we're going to hold on Mark. We're going to take that Jewish man and we're going to come back to him later. On the other side, we have the non-Jews. We have Epaphras, Luke, 
and Demas. Each of these we're going to take in, in a little bit. But what I, what I looked at with this, I'm going, God, what is, what is your heart with this group of men what is your heart with this group that's following around with Paul? And I came across the CDC report on loneliness. And I need to pull out my phone because that's where I have the report. So as I looked up what loneliness does to people, these are some of the things I found. One of them that I found was I thought really funny. It says loneliness affects young, adolescents, teenagers, young adults, and old adults. It's like, sweet, loneliness affects everybody. But then we get studies that tell us that loneliness can, or social isolation, can cause significant increases in a person's risk of premature death from causes such as that would rival obesity, smoking, and in, uh, physical inactivity. Social isolation was associated with an increase of about 50% in dementia. Poor social relationships was also in, showed an increase of about 30% in heart disease and a 32% increased risk of strokes. Loneliness is associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Loneliness is among the leading reasons for heart failure, four times greater increased risk of death and hospitalizations and accounts for a contributing factor in 57% of hospital ER visits. Loneliness is significant. Paul is saying, these are the guys that are with me. As I, as I've grown up reading Paul, I had initially this idea as a younger Christian that Paul was kind of a lone ranger. Like he was just kind of going out doing what he did. He was, I always pictured him as a short, ugly, bald, like blind man. Like what I'm going to be soon. Like I've, I've got the glasses. I'm working my way there. That's how I always pictured Paul. But as I've read more and more, he wasn't a lone ranger. He had men and women who were with him, helping him, taking life on with him. They were his crew. He wasn't lonely. He wasn't a lone ranger. And I think this shows us well out of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, where that writer says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Church, we gather to worship we gather to learn. We gather to pray together. But we also gather to be together. It is so incredibly important that we get together regularly and we do not neglect gathering with one another because it's how we're created. We're not created to be by ourselves hermits and never going to church, never gathering with other people. I know for me, when we went through the, the pandemic, one of the hardest things, and I didn't do a very good job of it, was being isolated from other people. I wanted and I needed to be around other people through that whole season. We, church, have opportunities to be with each other. On Sunday mornings, kids getting together for, for hanging out, playing as younger kids, and as a group and a body of believers. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a crew in the church, if you don't have a, a grace group within the church, if you don't have people that are Christians, maybe they don't attend this church, but you get together with them regularly, find one. We have many groups in this church. We have a lot of people who want to accept you in and bring you along and help you not be lonely. So we need to be meeting together as a church Let's look for each person that we can see. Maybe that person doesn't have a grace group. If you are walking and you are leading a group or you're a part of a group, find out what your group's heart is. Like, are we ready to bring in other people? And, and go find new people to bring into that group. Making sure that in this, uh, uh, in this room, there's not people who just feel lonely because no one's talking to them. No one's approaching them. No one's asking them to be a part of the, their crew. I'm grateful to be in this church. One of the 
first things I recognized when we first started attending here was how welcoming and how accepted we were as a family into the Grace family and encouraged to, to jump in with everybody. It's a wonderful thing that we do. Let's continue that heart, church. So we need that companionship. Second, we're going to look at um, Luke. So if you can go there to Luke, verse 14, the beloved physician. Luke is going to point us to the intentionality of vocation. And Pastor Mark, a couple weeks ago, jumped into my little section for preaching, and he talked quite a bit about Luke. So I'm not going to really recap a whole lot, except to say Luke was a physician. Luke traveled with Paul. Luke wrote the book of Luke. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. Luke was, an in very, he was a very intelligent man who used his training and his skills for the kingdom of God. We might, I'm not, you might not be a physician, a doctor. You might be an electrician. You might be an apprentice. You might be a plumber. You might be a school teacher. You might be a stay-at-home mom who's got the hardest job of ever educating your kids. What is your vocation? Just kind of think about it for a second. What's your job right now? How can you use your job for the kingdom of God? You might in your mind say, I am doing it. I am using my job as for the kingdom of God. Maybe you're retired. How am I using retirement? That's my season of life for the kingdom of God. Luke specifically took this skill and he applied it. And we have been so blessed by Luke. Luke is an elder quality man that we can look to and say he applied all of his life to the kingdom of God. He used it in missions. He used it for an apostle that we have so much to be thankful for because that man kept getting beat up. And having a doctor on his crew would be very helpful for the apostle Paul. He is the beloved physician. I think that's why he gets called so loved. So as we read or we learned back in Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And whatever you do in word or deed, your work, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. I do want to make one little comment towards the youth and those who are looking towards your vocation in the future and encourage you to think about medical. I love medical. I'm in the medical field as a medic. But I want to encourage you guys to think, like, could I go and do some training? Maybe there's some idea that you have that that could be fun. And I want, you to, I want to encourage you to consider it. The medical field is used for not just physical ailments, but they get called upon for mental ailments. They get called on for spiritual ailments. And there are so many opportunities, young men and women, to utilize that area for great good. So I just want to put that out there. I hope somebody, I believe somebody is thinking medical. I hope that encourages you to pursue it. Thirdly, maturity of prayer. We're going to look at Epaphras. Epaphras in this section gets the most press from Paul. Paul looks at this letter he's writing and he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, the Colossians, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. I read over that and didn't think much of it. And I was going, man, what, what is this saying about Epaphras? And it hit me. And this has become my prayer for the church. Like as often as I can remember to pray for us, which I'm trying to do daily. It is my prayer that we would stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. So I'm going to break this apart. Standing mature. What does that look like from Epaphras? In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, Paul writes, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In Ephesians 4.13, until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God 
to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul calls, or we're called to not be babies in Christ, drinking milk only of the word, but we, in Hebrews 5.14, we look for solid food, which is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. When Epaphras is praying for the Colossians, he's calling the Colossians to say, have a desire. I'm praying for you, Colossians, to have this desire that Paul's been talking about, to look to Christ as your all, to stand mature in Christ, and to be rising up to this level of stature and maturity, which is Christ. I'm praying for you, he says, Colossians, to stand mature. Not that you have it all perfectly figured out, but it means that you have time and understanding in the gospel, that you know how life works out and how faith in Jesus works out in your life in Christ. You've wrestled with doctrine. You've taken what you've been taught on Sunday mornings and you go home and you wrestle with it to see if those things are true. You build your life upon it, and it does not mean being mature that you are sinless. Going back a few weeks, we still sin every single day. It does not mean you're sinless. You might not be as sinful, but you're not sinless. You have learned how to deal with your sin. You've learned how to wrestle your flesh and walk in wisdom your life without so many self-inflicted sin wounds. Stand mature. That's Epaphras' first part of his prayer. The next thing he says is fully assured. This idea is that there's not a bunch of wavering, a bunch of back and forth. You know whom you believe, and you stand fully assured in that. As we've been going through Colossians, there's been a lot of passages and a lot of reminders not to be deceived by the elemental spirits of this world. There's Warning after warning saying, look out for these lies. Look out for these arguments. They seem plausible. Don't get sucked in by them. Don't get sucked in that walking with Christ isn't worth it. Don't get sucked in. You've done enough in your life at this point. You can coast. Don't get sucked into these ideas that make you waver back and forth in your walk with Christ. Lastly, Epaphras prays that you would fully know the will of God. Epaphras struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. What is somebody's will? What is somebody's will? Well, God has a will for our lives, and he gave us a very special book to teach us about it. And he gives us men and women in our lives who can help explain it. And he gives us his spirit within us that helps us discern it. But we learn God's will through time. When I'm going through decisions in life, I can think about my wife and I can think about how she looks at things and I can go man I think I think if my wife were right here she would say this and I've also learned that it's much better to call her and say is this what you think on this it's a maturity thing it's coming slowly but you get to know somebody so well that you you understand their will you get their desire and what their hope and their thought and their plan for your life is as we come to know the will of God, we go, God, what's your will in this this situation? God, what's your word say about this situation? It might not speak exactly to it, but you can discern the will of God in the situation. The idea here Paul is recording Epaphras praying is that you would know that you would have a knowledge of God so intimate 
and so steadfast and so seasons that you know down deep in your gut what God's heart is in every circumstance. Where you could say, I know my God. I know his love for me. I know my calling as his son or daughter. I know what his will is for my life. And I understand how I think, and I understand how I'm prone to wonder, and I understand how I can get distracted and drawn away, and I understand his calling me back day after day after day as I get into his word and I pray to him, and I'm going and I'm growing and I'm growing in this knowledge of who God is. It is a heart and a desire of prayer that the church would have a burning desire in its heart and a light of divine truth in its mind that they can walk out the coming days with faith and hope and maturity. That's my prayer for you, church. And I'm praying that we would all look at the person sitting next to us, look at our spouses, look at our children and say, God, I want this person to be mature. I want this person to be fully assured of, your, of who you are and what your will is for them in all ways and in every circumstance. And it's okay to pray the same prayer day after day for people if you mean it. But you got to mean it. So you can take a prayer like this and you can say, this is going to be my prayer for my kids. Or this is going to be my prayer for my wife. Or this is going to be my prayer for so and so. And it's okay to say the same words. Mean it. Mean it. Don't make it meaningless in your heart. Mean it for them. The last thing that Paul says in this is that I bear him witness that he's worked hard for you and those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Coming from missionary, church planning, Paul, that's a big statement. But I think it's a big statement because my, my belief is the church who is filled with the spirit of God Almighty who lives on earth is the most powerful entity on earth. And we have the greatest privilege, which is prayer with the God of all creation on behalf of other people. And every single prayer we pray does something before the throne of God in his will. We can pray once, we can pray a thousand times, and every single one of those prayers is effective because it's Jesus that we're praying through, it's Jesus that we're trusting in, and it can be so hard to pray. One of the first things that I get distracted from is prayer. I sit down to pray and my mind immediately goes to my laundry list. It can be so hard. But there is great reward, church, in struggling on all our efforts in prayer for others. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. There's maturity, church, when we pray. We grow in prayer. It takes effect of those we are praying for and the situations we're praying for. This last section that's the reality of a relationship is where we're going to talk about John Mark and Demas. And if you want to go ahead and pull out your, your little notes page, if you got it there, if you haven't. John, Mark, and Demas are a, are a unique couple of people in this list. We're told in it that Mark is the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have re received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Well, it's kind of an odd statement if we're just coming to this for the first time. If you've never picked up your Bible or a Bible before or you're here for the first time, that's kind of an odd thing to say about a person. Oh yeah, this guy who's Barnabas' cousin, if he comes to you, receive him. Well, what does that mean? John Mark is the guy who the Spirit of God used to pen the Gospel of Mark. He is the cousin of Barnabas. That gives us a connection to the book of Acts where John Mark joined Barnabas 
and Paul on their first missionary journey and then left them and went back to Jerusalem. Later, when they're getting ready for their second missionary journey, Barnabas wants to take John Mark, and Paul does not want to take John Mark. And the argument gets so heated that these friends split up. Barnabas and Paul split their own ways, and they go away. So as I looked at Barnabas, I'm like, okay, he is the gospel writer, a cousin and family, the deserter of missionaries, the divider, the divider of friends, and he's the drama-causing Mark. That's what we're getting about Mark here. But as we look here, Mark is alongside Paul. This is years later. Mark is there with Paul. And Mark says, or Paul says, if he comes to you, receive him. You've received instructions about him. If he comes, welcome him. Something took place there, church, between Paul and Mark. And that's what we'll get to here in a second. The other man, Demas. He's only listed three times in the Bible. In Philemon 1, he's listed as greeting the church or greeting Philemon. In Colossians 4, he's walking here in ministry with Paul and these other men. And later, in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says that Demas forsook the calling and pursued the world. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And that's what we know about Demas scripturally. If anybody's read or listened to the wonderful story, Pilgrim's Progress, there's a whole section towards the end of Demas's silver mine. And that's where Demas is seen in this book trying to entice people to get out of the way to the celestial kingdom. And those that go over and look fall down into the mine and die. Um, we don't get anything that that is Demas. We just get that Demas was in love with the world and deserted Paul at this time. If you would take out that page and look at it. I got a bigger copy because I can't see very well. I labeled it as the relationship protocol. Uh, being a paramedic, I think in boxes with arrows. So as anything comes up in my mind, I'm going through a box of this, yes, no, if this, no, yes, this, okay, this is what I need to do because it's all arrows. So that's why I wrote it up this way. And it was the way that it was initially presented to me that made so much sense. There is an act of sin at the top. Because of that act of sin, it goes to one or two lines. It's either I have sinned or I have been sinned against. That's the second box down. Then it goes to the next box. There's an involuntary response that we as humans get. It's either guilt or shame. And then we get a choice. That's where the arrow coming down splits both ways. We can respond one way in the flesh or we can respond to the other way in the spirit. And as you walk down either side, one box leads to the next. So if we're looking at this, and I'm going to not use any examples from my own life or anything, I'm making that commitment, but I am going to say there was a time when I was walking in such a unknown of how to make the next step. I needed something like this brought into my life of what it means to forgive and walk in healing. I needed somebody, and it was greatly given by Pastor Mark that night, that there's work done after forgiveness. I grew up in the church. I've been in the church basically my whole life, and I've never been taught that there was work to be done after forgiveness. That's nothing against those that raised me. It's just that that's what I, I had gone through the scriptures and I'd been taught. I hadn't gone like what takes place after forgiveness. So when this was given to me, I actually got really passionate. I'm like, this needs to be given to everybody who just said the sinner's prayer. Because if you would do a, me a favor, look to your right and everybody except for the people on the far line, what do you see? 
you see a person. And everybody looked to the left, except for the people on that side. What do you see? You see people. And as we're walking out life together, we are together with people. And a couple weeks ago, it was very well preached that we sin. If we say we do not sin, we are liars. We sin. We sin against each other. We sin against God. So how do we walk this out with people? Well, if you're anything like me, it was, well, they sinned, so forgive them. And then just move on. Keep going. But it, it got to a point in my life where it's like that, that doesn't, that's not working. What am I missing? So we're going to step through this one, one piece at a time. If you would, with your pen or pencil, under response in flesh, I want you to just write in however big or small you want, but write the word pride. Write the word pride there for me. Pride is how we end up responding in the flesh. Pride leads to shame. Pride leads to withdrawal. Pride leads to fear, to blaming others, to bitterness, to anger. And as you see at the bottom of that box, it destroys relationships. If you go to the other side, respond in the spirit. The first thing we have to do is recognize I've sinned or somebody has sinned against me and I need to choose to resolve this. I need to choose to walk this out with this person. The first thing we have to do, there has to be confession. And if you would like to turn to 1 John chapter 1 with me, we're going to do a little bit of page turning here. These will be pretty quick. 1 John 1, verse 5 through 10. This is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I don't know how John could make it any clearer that we as Christians are still sinful. We're sinful. It is a fact of who we are, and when it comes to an act of sin, the first step when we say, I'm going to resolve this issue, is to confess it. If I've sinned or someone's sinned against me, the first step is somebody saying, I did it. I don't want to deceive myself anymore. I don't want that person being deceived anymore. The confession is critical to be able to say, I did it. Now in the line that says from confession over towards the pride box, what keeps you from wanting to confess? Please write it on the line, just for your, for your sake. Write it on the line. You don't have to show anybody. What is it that keeps you from wanting to confess personally? But we're going to move the other way. We're going to move from confession to repentance. And for that, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 21. And I'm going to back up to verse 19. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish. And that you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling and jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many who, sorry, many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. 
Paul in this in this book of Colossians is is grieving over the church that he rebuked earlier, and he's saying, I, I want to come and I want to see you, but I'm scared that you've not repented. I'm scared you haven't actually turned away from your sin and towards the one that you've sinned against. That's what repentance is. It's turning away from the sin that you have now confessed. I've done this, and I'm going to turn away from that sin towards the one I sinned against and say with that action, I value you more than my sin. Repentance for a relationship to heal has to have both people willing to be engaged. Confession is the person who sinned. Repentance, both people then need to be engaged in it. One person needs to turn away and that other person might need to turn towards and say, I'm going to also face towards you now in this act. You are repenting, I'm going to turn towards you and I'm gonna say your sin is not as big of a deal as our relationship. Or my sin is not as big as, is not what I want in comparison to our relationship. Both people are active in this. The next one, oh sorry, <laughs> from repentance. What keeps you from wanting to repent? If you can write that on the line. And then we're going to go down. The next one, forgiveness. And for this, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6. And I thought about trying to have everybody pray the Lord's Prayer together. But that gets really messy because of the different versions that we've learned, whether it's King James or NIV or whatnot. So I'm going to read it. And it should sound really familiar. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Matthew says that's what Jesus taught them to pray. Then Matthew records Jesus' commentary on the prayer. Jesus said, if you forgive others their trespasses, their sins, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of your trespasses. This is where my understanding growing up and learning of, for, of what to do in broken sin relationships ended was forgiving and moving on. If I don't forgive, I won't be forgiven by my father. So I want to go and be forgiven, so I better forgive. I'm forgiving. And that's good and right. The forgiveness that we have, though, is based on the justice of God. The recognition that God is just and every sin will be justly punished either for the Christian through Jesus' payment for us on the cross or for the non-believer by the wrath of God being forever poured out on that person in a real hell. Our forgiveness is based on the justice of God, whether Christ's sacrifice or eternity in hell. God's generosity to us is what allows us to forgive and to ex forgive ourselves and to extend that forgiveness to others. What in your life causes you to want to withhold forgiveness? Write it on the line. The next box down, reconciliation. I don't know what I looked like the night that I was learning about this. But I know how I remember it. It's that my jaw was on the floor. And I believe I was crying, going, oh, it is so true. Reconciliation. We're going to go back to Matthew 5, verse 24. 
It's only a couple pages to your left. In verse 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put into prison. Truly I say you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Reconciliation is the, is the idea that for two parties, two people to come back to a place of peace with one another, have to do what's necessary to heal the broken parts of the relationship. It's essentially each person saying, I'm taking full responsibility for what has been done. I am owning everything in this relationship that I have done in it to see this relationship healed. This one is verbal, if you would. This one is coming to an agreement. This one is speaking to one another and saying, I love you so much. I care for you so much. I am so much more concerned over this relationship that I'm gonna do absolutely everything I can to see it healed. This one is like the commitment and the, the verbal agreement that that's gonna take place. Restitution is like the other side of the coin. So restitution is the practical. It's the actual working out of what that looks like in a day-by-day, moment-by-moment situation. So restitution, sorry, reconciliation, I love you. I care for you. I am more concerned over this situation. Restitution I'm going to do everything I can to give back to you what I broke. I'm going to do everything I can to give back to you what I've stolen. And this is where we get the story in Luke about Zacchaeus. So if you want to turn to Luke chapter 19, just going to read it. As you're turning there, as Jesus entered Jericho, he was passing through. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see Jesus, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was a very small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when, he, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into the, be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus got rich off of being a sinner and stealing money. So his response, he's confessing in his response, I'm making a commitment, Jesus, to practically do what I know needs to be done. If I've taken money from somebody, I'm going to restore it fourfold. If I've taken trust from somebody, I'm going to work in a way, I'm going to live my life in a way to build back that trust, not just to the level that I've stolen, but fourfold. I've often heard it by counselors that if you have been in an issue, if you've had a problem with your marriage or your kids or a situation for one year, it's going to take at least one year to work that situation fully out. That's because of restitution. 
That's because it's taking time to say, I'm committed to this. I'm building this back. I'm trying to give you back everything that I have broken in this relationship. On those two lines, what causes us as individuals to say, I don't, I don't care about the relationship that much. I'm not willing to make that commitment. Or what causes us to not want to give back what we've taken? Lastly, the step that we hope happens quickly is restoration. In our church covenant, having received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, having obeyed him in believer's baptism, being in agreement with the Grace Baptist's vision, statement of faith, constitution, and bylaws, I commit myself to God and to the other members of this church to live as a growing disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, loving God, loving people, making disciples, and following Jesus I will protect the unity of the church by quickly resolving personal conflicts. This is where we're hoping in the covenant to get to every time. We want to get to the place of restoration. We want to get to the place where we have unity with our maturity. Where we can say there was an act of sin. And it's in the past. And I'm able to walk forward with this person no longer hurting because of it. It's not saying it never happened. It's saying I've acknowledged it, we've dealt with it, and we're moving on for the kingdom without pain. Without the hurt. Without the gnawing at your mind at night keeping you awake. One of the best examples I believe of this is in John chapter 21. Jesus went on trial. Peter standing in the courtyard denied Christ three times. The rooster crowed and he ran out. Broken because he denied the Lord Jesus. After Jesus rose from the grave, Jesus takes Peter And after they had finished breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he was grieved because he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus looked at this man who three times denied that he even knew Jesus and came back to him and said, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to restore this relationship. I'm going to bring this place where it's done, where, Peter, you can walk forward as a minister of my gospel, and you are going to be called out, and you're going to be walking in faith, and you're going to be used mightily for the kingdom. But I've got to ask you, Peter, do you love me? Because that's going to lead to the restoration. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know everything great. I'm commissioning you for work. Jesus got Peter to that place. That's where we want to be, where we can look at the person where the act of sin took place and we can say, I love you. Or they, I, I can ask, or we can ask, do you love me? And the person would be like, yes, I love you more than what happened. Do you love me? Yes, I love you more than the trust that was broken. Do you love me? Yes. And you know I love you because of the time and the effort and the intentionality to fix this broken relationship. That's what's being asked here in restoration. So going back to Colossians, we can look at Mark and Peter again. I'm sorry, Mark and Demas. 
Verse 10, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. There had been such a split between Paul and Barnabas because of who Mark was. We don't know if it was full sin, but it really made him mad. We don't know everything that took place, but we know because of what's said here that at some point Paul had written instructions concerning John Mark. And it would appear that it was contrary to accepting him. Because here Paul is saying, accept this man. He's a comfort to me. If he comes to you, welcome him. Paul is saying that relationship's restored. There was an act in the past, church, that you are aware of. That relationship is restored. It's gone through this process. There's been time. And he's with me now. He sends you greetings. And if he comes to you, receive him. Welcome him. We are restored. Be restored to him. The opposite of that is what we see in Demas. Demas, at this moment, is with, Je is with Paul. But later in the future, the last thing we hear about him is he has abandoned Paul. Currently, he's with him. He's going to leave him. And there's a split at that time. We don't know what happened with Demas in the end. But we do know that our Lord Jesus loves his children. And if there is a split that you don't know how it's going to end up in the end. I've got a few of those in my life. I don't know how that relationship's going to end up in the end. But I'm going to look at what I've written down on those lines and say, God, I care more about your son, your daughter that I have an issue with that I have a broken relationship with, and I'm going to fight against those things that all are part of the pride and relationship destroyers to hopefully one day see a restored relationship there. I'm going to practically keep my mind and my heart in a place where I'm forgiving and I'm waiting and I'm looking for opportunities for that reconciliation. I'm looking for opportunities for that restitution. I'm constantly as it comes up being forgiving because if we do not forgive it shows we're not forgiven the moment in those relationships that those people respond we can then move forward it might not ever happen they might not ever respond but we can keep ourselves in a place moving forward with one another ready to walk out this redeeming relationship protocol with one another We see what happened to John Mark as a positive. We don't know what happened with Demas, but it looks like a negative. The final thought that I want to say with this is that it might be fought against in the restoration, I'm sorry, the reconciliation and the restitution where you might say, well, that's just works-based. That's just works-based. You're working for that forgiveness. And I would say it kind of looks like that. But if we think about our lives with Jesus, Jesus came because there was a sin. Jesus came because I am sinful. You are sinful. We are sinful. Jesus came because of sin. And he made the good confession before Pilate. And he turned his face towards the redeeming act in Jerusalem. He set his face for an act of love for each and every one of us that he would die for the punishment of our sins on the cross. He turned his face to us long before we even cared to turn our face to him. He forgave us as his arms were stretched. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. 
I read that and I go, I, I still don't know what I'm doing sometimes, but I receive your forgiveness. He forgives us. That's why we can be forgiven. There's reconciliation. He's saying, I'm so committed to this relationship, church. I'm going to give you my spirit when you believe. And then he says, I'm so committed to this relationship, church. I'm going to cause you to walk in my ways. And I'm so committed to this relationship, church, that there is a great and a glorious and a wonderful eternity forever with our Lord, where we will be in perfect restoration with him. And myself get to come and say, I confess I'm a sinner, Jesus. I confess I did it. I confess and I turn to you, Lord Jesus. I confess and I am thankful and I receive your forgiveness. And in my life, I'm going to be committed to walking before you and I'm going to walk out my life showing that I love you and am forgiven. That's not works-based. That's saying I'm more concerned about the relationship with you, Jesus, than I am about my dead fleshly self. I'm more concerned about this relationship than my sin so that we can seek restoration and eternity with him. So as you think of this, I want you to just ask yourself, and music team, if you want to come on up, that would be great. I want you to ask yourself, church, is there a relationship that you're needing to turn your face towards that person? Is there a relationship where you're needing to say, man, I need to let go of my pride or my arrogance, or I need to let go of my self-entitlement. I need to fight these different elements here. And I want to ask for just 30 seconds of prayer where we ask the Lord this morning to search us and know us and see if there is any wicked way in us right now. So if you just take a few seconds to ask God that. Heavenly Father, we have been restored to you because your son has done it all. And I pray, Lord, that we would be so quick as a church as we seek out to be mature, standing firm in all of your will, growing into elder quality men and women that we would rightfully and quickly walk out our relationships, our broken relationships with one another. God, help us to fight the flesh as we exhale out. Help us to breathe in of your spirit and your word As we live this rhythm of life, God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you have made the way for restored relationships. Amen. 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 Sounds like one of those things, uh, Jason, when we get Jesus right, we get everything right. Yeah.